Good evening, everyone. Welcome to California Today. I'm David Zhang. Here is a look at some of today's top stories. Southern California city of El Monte raided a gang and arrested several members. The gang has ties to a previous shooting that killed two officers. Twitter now rebranded as X has a new competitor. China-owned TikTok is now expanding its own features to support text-only posts. State lawmakers are considering putting restriction on cannabis labeling. They say current packaging appeals too much to children. This morning, one Southern California Police Department executed a raid resulting in several arrests and the seizure of illegal substances and weapons. NTD's Christina Corona has more from El Monte. The Almani Police Department conducted a series of raids targeting one San Gabriel Valley gang who is known for terrorizing the city and is connected with one specific gang member who took the lives of two of their officers last year. On Wednesday, several gang members were taken into custody in a multi-agency law enforcement operation that tied to the killing of Almani officers Michael Paredes and Joseph Santana. On June 14, 2022, officers Santana and Paredes responded to a domestic violence call at the Siesta Inn Motel. The officers discovered Justin Flores, who had barricaded himself with his wife. The officers rescued the woman, but were shot to death by Flores, who later fatally shot himself in the head. As family members, friends and colleagues were devastated by the killings, the Quiet Village street gang celebrated the murders. They celebrated through posters of the killer. They celebrated through tagging graffiti in honor of the murderer. And they did all this to further their reputation for intimidation and violence in the community. The Almani Police Department reached out to federal authorities to initiate the investigation of the Quiet Village Street Gang and their criminal activities. This morning, law enforcement officers fanned out across the San Gabriel Valley and arrested 11 defendants on federal and state charges. Most of these defendants were members or associates of the Quiet Village Street Gang. Others were members of the Whittier Vario Locos Gang, which is an ally of Quiet Village. The indictment charges the gangsters with running a criminal enterprise which engaged in various different criminal acts, including murder, attempted murder, witness intimidation, drug trafficking, fraud, and illegal gambling. We spoke with the Almani police chief, Jake Fisher, who told us how the department prepared for this morning's raid in terms of intelligence gathering and planning. Well, it was led by then Chief Ben Lowry, who um, reached out to the FBI. The Almani police department has a um, FBI agent that works for our department, and we work together with many other agencies with the uh, San Gabriel Safe Streets Task Force, and that that connection that we automatically had and Chief Lowry's leadership at that time helped naturally flow this investigation very swiftly and quickly. Chief Fisher also tells us about challenges they face when conducting a raid involving dangerous criminals. Anytime you're dealing with a, a violent criminal street gang, there are uh, obvious challenges. They have no respect for authority or good members of the community. So that uh, is always dangerous and complex but uh, we were able to be very successful in, in this investigation and uh, came out to a, a good conclusion. With this raid, the Almani Police Department said they finally got justice for their two fallen officers. And a final message from attorney Martin Estrada. Today's arrests and charges should assure our community that we are there to protect you. These charges and arrests demonstrate that we will use our full resources to combat violent crime and to ensure that members of the community, no matter what neighborhood you are in, have the opportunity to live in safety and peace. With the help of several law enforcement agencies, the Almani Police Department has just arrested several gang members, seized a variety of firearms and narcotics, therefore making Almani and surrounding cities a safer place to live, work and visit. Christina Corona, NTD News, Almani. The battle is heating up for text-based platforms. China-owned video sharing app TikTok is now taking aim at X, the company formerly known as Twitter. TikTok announced this week that it will allow users to create text-only posts similar to posts on X. 
The new feature has a word limit of 1,000 characters, similar to Instagram stories. Posts can also contain hashtags and allow people to tag other users. With the new launch, TikTok becomes the second major social media firm to challenge the company formerly known as Twitter. Earlier this month, Meta Platform CEO Mark Zuckerberg launched Threads, also a text-only application. Beyond that, TikTok's product expansion doesn't appear to stop there. According to a Wall Street Journal report, the video sharing app also plans to launch an e-commerce site to sell Chinese-made goods in the U.S. TikTok's moves come as the company faces heightened scrutiny by American officials and a potential ban in the U.S. That's over concerns that its data collection poses a risk to national security. Speaking of tech, both Democratic and Republican senators are expressing alarm over artificial intelligence. At a Senate hearing yesterday, experts in the field, including a UC Berkeley professor, offered a testimony on what the technology could be capable of. Here are the details. A Senate Judiciary Subcommittee held a hearing on Tuesday about oversight for AI technology. Subcommittee Chairman Richard Blumenthal expressed alarm over the risks of the technology. We're here now because AI is already having a significant impact on our economy, safety, and democracy. The dangers are not just extinction, but loss of jobs, one of potentially the worst nightmares that we have. Dario Amade is the CEO of AI company Anthropic. He said certain steps in bioweapons production involve knowledge that can't be found on Google or in textbooks and require a high level of expertise. For a straightforward extrapolation of today's systems to those we expect to see in two to three years suggests a substantial risk that AI systems will be able to fill in all the missing pieces, enabling many more actors to carry out large-scale biological attacks. We believe this represents a grave threat to U.S. national security. Computer science professor Stuart Russell of UC Berkeley has a different concern. We can present to the system a great deal of information about an individual, uh, everything they've ever written or published on Twitter or Facebook, um, their social media presence, their floor speeches, um, and train the system and ask it to generate a disinformation campaign particularly for that person. And then we can do that for a million people before lunch. Lawmakers from both parties expressed concerns over the technology. Senator Josh Hawley is ranking member of the subcommittee. As AI develops, we've got to make sure that we have safeguards in place that will ensure this new technology is actually good for the American people. I'm confident it'll be good for the companies. The hearing took place days after AI companies, including OpenAI, Alphabet, and Meta Platforms, made voluntary commitments to the White House. They agreed to implement measures such as watermarking AI-generated content to help make the technology safer. Meanwhile, in state-level politics, a proposed California bill is attempting to impose stricter regulations on cannabis labeling and marketing. This comes as hospitals have seen a rise in cannabis poisoning among children. Hospitals across California are reporting a rise in emergency room visits of children exposed to cannabis. In an attempt to curb this, California lawmakers are considering a bill to impose more regulations on packaging. Assembly Bill 1207, authored by Assemblywoman Jackie Irwin, would ban cannabis product packaging that appeals to children. Irwin told the Epic Times, quote, Children being poisoned by cannabis is a public safety issue. The danger that cannabis products pose to children is significant. When the packaging of these products is attractive to children, it directly leads to pediatric hospitalizations. Irwin's bill would also outlaw artificial and natural flavors used in cannabis vaping products. Only cannabis terpenes, the natural essence contained within the plant, would be allowed in vape cartridges and devices. Many experts have linked the legalization of recreational marijuana with Proposition 64, passed in 2016, to a rise in reports of cannabis poisonings. AB 1207 is currently in the Senate Appropriations Committee. While cannabis might be getting more restrictions, psychedelics could see less. A California organization is gathering signatures in an effort to put a measure that would decriminalize magic mushrooms on the 2024 ballot. But groups that oppose the idea say it would cause more harm to Californians. 
An organization known as Decriminalize California is hoping to gather enough signatures to place an initiative on the November 2024 ballot. The initiative will let voters decide if magic mushrooms should be decriminalized. The group must collect nearly 547,000 signatures by January 10, 2024 to qualify for the ballot. According to the organization, this is the third attempt to pass the measure. If successful, psychedelic mushrooms could be sold anywhere. It would also allow adults to grow mushrooms. The measure would also clear criminal records for previous convictions involving magic mushrooms. But many law enforcement agencies and organizations, along with a few family groups, have opposed the idea. Penny Nance, CEO and president of Concerned Women for America, told the Epic Times, quote, Legalizing another mind-altering substance will cause more harm to California citizens, further ruin its cities, and erode its workforce. According to the U.S. Drug Enforcement Administration, the mushrooms contain psilocybin. The federal government classifies the drug as an illegal Schedule One substance. Users can overdose on magic mushrooms, which can cause psychosis and death. Bill Thomas, NTD News, California. We now take a short break, everyone, but here's what we have for you when we come right back. California is expanding a pilot program to fight drug addiction. The solution? Gift cards and other incentives. A TV producer comments on Christopher Nolan's Oppenheimer. He praises the way the filmmaker portrays life during World War II. Oppenheimer's a former home also happens to be up for grabs in the Bay Area. These stories and more coming up on California Today. Welcome back to California Today, everybody. I'm your host, David Zhang. California is fighting against drug addiction through the use of gift cards. The state now expands its pilot program to many counties to provide incentives for those dealing with addiction. NTD's David Lamb reports. California, in its fight against meth addiction, is using gift cards to reward people for staying sober. The state has expanded its pilot program to 24 counties, targeting major areas facing drug addiction and homelessness, including San Francisco, Sacramento, and Los Angeles. California's Department of Health Care Services says eligible Medi-Cal beneficiaries will participate in a 24-week outpatient program, followed by six or more months of recovery support services. Now, individuals will earn motivational incentives in the form of low-denomination gift cards, with a retail value determined per treatment episode. The San Francisco Department of Public Health says they're expanding treatment options for people with stimulant use disorder. In Santa Clara, California, David Lamb, NTD News. The attorney for the former UC Davis student charged in two stabbing deaths says he's not mentally fit for trial. But prosecutors believe that he could be using the court system to his advantage. Carlos Dominguez, the former student charged with murder, has been deemed unfit for trial. He has been charged for the stabbing deaths of two people and attempted murder of a third near UC Davis. His attorney, Dan Hutchison, said Dominguez has not showered in nearly three months he's been in jail, goes days without eating, and believes he will return to classes. He said Dominguez is observed every 15 minutes because he is on suicide watch. Hutchison said he will present evidence showing that Dominguez started showing outward signs of schizophrenia toward the end of his freshman year. Prosecutors said Dominguez is toying with the system and should face criminal trial. Jurors will ultimately decide whether he is fit for trial. To be found mentally unfit, the defense must show that Dominguez cannot currently understand court proceedings, help his attorney in his defense, and understand his own status in the criminal proceeding. If Dominguez is found not competent, he will be sent to a state mental health hospital instead of proceeding with a criminal trial. Dominguez had been a third-year student at UC Davis, majoring in biological sciences until April 25th when he was expelled. Several days later, prosecutors say he began carrying out three stabbings on or near the campus. He is charged in the deaths of a 50-year-old homeless man and a 20-year-old UC Davis student. A homeless woman who was attacked in her tent survived. He was arrested on May 4th near the location of the second attack. 
Previously, he said he was guilty and wanted to apologize and that he did not want an attorney. Dominguez's former girlfriend said he stopped eating and caring about his grooming. One former roommate said Dominguez smoked marijuana and talked about psychedelic mushrooms. The trial could take up to eight days. The Salesforce CEO issued a recent warning last week for San Francisco and the surrounding Bay Area. He says the city is never going to bounce back and its overall economic recovery is bleak. In a recently published interview, Mark Benioff, CEO of Salesforce, warns of the dire economic outlook for San Francisco and the surrounding Bay Area. Benioff is an anchor tenant in San Francisco and is the city's largest employer. He says that the city is, quote, never going back to the way it was before COVID-19. Last week, in a bid to revive the city's downtown area, Mayor London Breed proposed putting city workers into downtown buildings. Breed says in a letter that some city agencies can, quote, lead on recovery by investing in high-quality office space for workers, and noted that a shift to hybrid work resulted in an overall reduced demand for office space and correspondingly lower rents for high-quality buildings. But according to Benioff, the mayor's office needs to come up with a program that will turn dormant office spaces into housing and hire additional police officers to deal with the surge in crime. Over the past few months, retailers like Whole Foods, T-Mobile, Walgreens, and others have moved out of the area. One of California's oldest newspapers, the Santa Barbara News Press, has declared bankruptcy. In an email, one of its managing editors said the company ran out of money to pay its employees. The Pulitzer Prize-winning Santa Barbara News Press, one of California's oldest newspapers, has stopped publishing after its owner declared the 150-year-old publication bankrupt. The newspaper became an online-only publication in April, but its last digital edition was posted Friday when owner Wendy McCaw filed for bankruptcy. Reports say managing editor Dave Mason broke the news to staff in an email Friday. Mason wrote, They ran out of money to pay us. They will issue final paychecks when the bankruptcy is approved in court. On Tuesday, the news press website was still online, with the most recent stories published Friday. There was no mention that it would cease publishing or that it has declared bankruptcy. At its height, the newspaper founded in 1855 had a daily circulation of 45,000 and was published seven days a week, serving Santa Barbara. A TV producer said the movie Oppenheimer could be a great part of his filmmaker's legacy since it explores the ups and downs of human life during World War II. For those interested in the personal life of the renowned physicist, his former Bay Area home is up for sale. Two movies, Oppenheimer and Barbie, are currently the most talked about films. Tommy Habib, a TV host and producer, says Oppenheimer is much more serious compared to the other current box office hit. Christopher Nolan took this, this book and this story and, and really turned it into something amazing. I'm, I'm really, I gotta tell you, um, it is, it's a difficult, it's difficult content, and, but it's engaging and it will keep you riveted at the at the edge of your seat. I, I question sometimes you have to be careful using black and white, but they really they really integrated this well in some of those uh, scenes where they brought in that elements of, of black and white and mixed color. Habib believes the World War II era film will be a great part of Nolan's legacy. Nolan takes us on this this amazing ride through this this fellow's life. And we watched him hit some highs that were beyond belief. I mean, heroic highs and then hit some lows. Uh, and that's real life. So the important thing, and I think the takeaway is that nobody's immune to, to being depressed or hitting these amazing heights in life. For those doing a double feature of Barbenheimer, he suggests watching Oppenheimer first, then Barbie, to leave the theater in a lighter mood. Julius Robert Oppenheimer was first drawn into politics during the rise of Adolf Hitler. Historians have said the father of the atomic bomb was secretly associated with the Communist Party, but there was no record of him ever joining one. 
For those curious about Oppenheimer's early life, his former home is on the market in Berkeley for about $1.5 million. Built in 1923, the Berkeley Hills home spans about 3,900 square feet. It consists of four oversized units, which includes one two-bed, one-bath, one one-bed, one one-bath, plus an office, and two studios with stunning bay views. Each unit has its own private balcony. Now let's hear from NTD's Tyler Castile for your sports roundup. Thank you, David. I'm Tyler Castillo taking you through California Today's Sports Roundup. Now's the chanting heard at Tuesday's game. As seen from footage that Twitter users posted, the Oakland A's played at a sold-out Oracle Park in San Francisco yesterday afternoon where fans joined together in an attempt to unite the Bay. This was after reports circulated about the A's relocating to Las Vegas after spending the last 55 years in Oakland. Outside of Oracle Park, at South Beach Park, posters with Unite the Bay were handed out and t-shirts with Sell and Stay written on them were sold to fans heading to the game. In a joint effort, both Giants and A's fans started to chant Sell the Team during the fifth inning, a message to the A's current owner John Fisher. In the end of the day, the Giants ended up winning the game by a score of 2-1. And now in football news, 49ers general manager John Lynch has gone out and told the media that Brock Purdy was cleared and ready to go after undergoing elbow surgery in March to repair his UCL. Brock Purdy can now participate in team practices and training camp without any restrictions in place for him. 49er fans now await to see who the future starting quarterback will be now that both Trey Lance and Brock Purdy are fully healthy. And that's the sports roundup for today. I'm Tyler Castillo. Back to you, David. Thanks, Tyler. All right, everyone, that's all we've got for you tonight. We would like you to join us again on California Today every weekday at 8 p.m. Make sure to check out our broadcasts at ntd.com slash California today. You will find all of our top latest clips there, ready to share with friends and family. Send us a message on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Gunjing World, or through our email california.today at ntd.com. If you'd like to share a news tip or let us know how we're doing, we'd love to hear from you. I'm David Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.